started. Um, first, everyone, thank you for, for joining um, and welcome to what is going to be the first conversation of our community of practice for COVID communications. Um, for those of you I haven't met, uh, my name is Eric Zimmerman. I'm a director at Hathaway Communications. Um, before we kick off, I just want to give you a bit of background on where this community uh, practice came from um, and, and what we're hoping to accomplish together. Um, I'm joined on the line here by my colleagues, Carrie Shum, Carlos Diaz, um, and Caroline Jaros. Um, and together we've been managing the communications work stream of the State and Territory Alliance for Testing or, or STAT. Um, so convened by the Rockefeller Foundation, STAT is a group of now I think about 26 states and territories working together um, on a weekly basis to share insights, best practices, successful strategies, lessons learned about all aspects um, of the COVID response. And a really important part of that work has been how we communicate with the public and how we motivate them to adopt the behaviors that we need them to adopt. It's the vision of you know, the Rockefeller Foundation that we've really been lucky to be a part of um, is that as much as we bring cutting edge science and evidence to bear on developing a vaccine, we should bring that same cutting edge science and evidence to bear on how to actually get people to take you know, the vaccine once it's available now that it is. Um, and studying how and why people take the actions that they do is to us really all that strategic communications is. Um, so for the last several months, the work stream has been conducting audience research, crafting messages, uh, creating content, providing hands-on help as STAT members and participants do the really important work of, of engaging their um, communities. Uh, but recently, you know, we've begun to realize more and more that there is no part of this pandemic response in which collaboration, learning, sharing information is more important um, than what we're learning about communications. Um, so we've started the process of transitioning this group from 20 or 25 of us working together on a common project um, to perhaps several hundred of us um, sharing lessons and working together towards a common goal. You know, so your involvement in this group can be as much or as little as, as you would like. If this is the first, last, and only conversation that you join us for, we're still thrilled to have you. Um, thank you for being here today. We hope, hope you get a lot of value out of it. Um, we also hope that many of you will choose to participate in this community moving forward. You know, the whole reason for expanding this is that the more of us um, can share information, the stronger all of our communications will be. And likewise, the more that we hear from you, the more that we can tailor the work that we're doing to actually meet your needs you know, and your communications challenges. Um, so for each of our biweekly conversations starting today, we want to end that conversation or you know, culminate the conversation um, with questions about how we can actually take this discussion and make it actionable for you after the call. Um, so that involves two things. One, please share your thoughts, questions, concerns in the chat box or the Q&A function throughout this process. Those can be clarification questions, substantive questions, a tool that comes to mind that would help you put this into practice, anything and everything, please just, just put it all out there. Um, and then also involves communications between these biweekly calls. And we'll be talking more about how we may be um, communicating with each other moving forward. Um, so I'm gonna pause there. We have a great session today that we're really excited about, about a, an unfortunately very important topic, which is misinformation and disinformation specifically about, about vaccines. Um, but I wanna turn it over to Estelle Willey from the Rockefeller Foundation just to talk a little bit more about our speakers today, um, and then we will get started. And thank you all again for being here. Estelle? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we're super excited about today's session on how to counter COVID-19 misinformation, specifically vaccines. Um, with me today, we have Claire Wardle, um, an expert in information disorder. Um, she's a co-founder and U.S. director of First Draft News. Um, founded in 2015, uh, First Draft has been working to protect communities from harmful dis disinformation um, by sharing tips and resources to build a more resilient um, and improve access to accurate information. So um, throughout the pandemic, they've been working with the World Health Organization, UNICEF, 
you name it, um, and providing a range of resources to fight mis and disinformation, um, including online courses for journalists, resource and guides for the communities, and also case studies and data on narratives, which I think you're going to be hearing more from in just a second. Um, and then next up, we have Stephanie Friedhoff, who is an expert really sitting at the intersection of health communications and health misinformation. Um, she works with Dr. Ashish Jha, who you may know. Um, he's the Dean of the Brown University School of Public Health. Um, and, there's, and she's specifically focused on the school's COVID-19 response. Um, she's also the principal on the COVID-19 Testing Communications Toolkit, which we'll put a link into the chat for you all, which is a free resource for anyone looking to communicate on the importance of COVID-19 testing to communities in America. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire. Thank you. Thanks so much, Estelle, and thanks everybody for being here. Uh, depending on where you are, I'm on the East Coast, it's four o'clock. So I hope you're somewhere having a cup of tea with your feet up. Uh, the idea of this webinar is that it's hopefully gonna be interactive and most importantly, useful. And so no webinar would be a webinar without a poll. So I have under good authority that there is a poll elf somewhere who's gonna put something up on the screen that will help us understand a little bit more about all of you. Yes, that would be me, the original Caroline. Um, if you all could uh, check out the link at the top or the phone number, um, we're going to be doing something a little different. So you can text in your answers or put them in the chat, whatever's easiest. But um, you can text Carlos Diaz 411 to 22333 and then all of your answers. Um, so the first question we have is where do you have the most difficulty? responding to misinformation, uh, conversations with friends and family, one-on-one -on -one interactions with community members or patients, social media, Facebook, Twitter, responding to traditional media requests, TV, print, and radio. So you'll see that your answers will pop up on the screen. And there li the link that Carlos put in the chat box will take you right to the screen where you can answer that. Awesome. Great. Suspenseful as well, doing it this way. Need the Jeopardy music. <laughs> okay, so I think that's probably, um, I think we're getting a sense that it's um, half A, half C. Uh, which is interesting. I think there's lots of um, recognition now that conversations one-on-one -on -one with people are now uh, full of misinformation. It's not just Facebook and Twitter. So we're gonna talk a little bit about ways to respond to these things. Um, I'm gonna share my screen um, because I've got a few pictures to share, which is makes it easier when talking about misinformation. If you have any questions as I go, um, please put them into the chat box and Eric is gonna say, hey, Claire, stop, there's a question. Um, but hopefully it will be pretty clear as I go through. Sometimes I talk at speed when I get excited. Um, so also tell me to slow down if I'm getting too excited. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk to you today about vaccine narratives from legitimate questions to conspiracy theories. Cause I'm gonna talk a little bit about misinformation is a problem, but we also have a problem that people are confused and where then there are vacuums, that's when misinformation um, floods in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So there's three uh, takeaway points. The first one, this will not surprise you, it's why you're on the call, is that communication is critical. And this is a tweet by Zainab Sufechi, who is a communications professor at the University of North Carolina, and is just genius right now in terms of talking about COVID and the missteps we've taken. And Facebook has just rolled out new guidelines this week that they will take down more vaccine misinformation. But Zainab said, mm, is this retroactive? Because in which case they'd have to take down most of the public health advice, including from the CDC and the WHO and major newspapers from the first six months of the pandemic. And whilst it's quite depressing to read, we do have to understand that there were some significant mistakes that have happened over the last 11 months. And we can't stop all of those, but we have to recognize that that has created a really wobbly foundation upon which we're now trying to work. And so we do have to own up to that and think about for the next pandemic, how do we make 
make sure we don't make the same mistakes. The second, as I said, misinformation isn't the only problem. I get somewhat frustrated when journalists call me up and say, is this why communities of color are not getting vaccinated because of Bill Gates uh, conspiracies? And I have to say, no, as we all know, there are many reasons why many people don't trust medical systems, systemic racism being one of them. So we also have to recognize that these things are intertwined um, and they're critical in terms of understanding all this. It's not just conspiracies about Bill Gates microchipping us. And finally, um, the current information ecosystem means that missteps by trusted information providers are being weaponized. And so I apologize for playing an Alex Jones clip, but it is critical for some of the things I'm gonna talk about in this presentation. So they're talking about the polio vaccine in Africa, but it teaches us a lot. Bill Gates was on CBS News. And he said 80% of the people get sick? Yeah. And 20% of them go to the hospital? No, it was two vaccines. They said one vaccine, 100% got sick. And a certain percent went to the hospital. The other, 80% got sick. And 20% of those were And sometimes possible. that does happen even with the flu vaccine, right? Like sometimes I, I, people get sick. I swear get a to God, sick. you type in Bill Gates grilled by CBS. I'll bring it up. Pull, pull up AP Bill Gates polio vaccine. But that's a coronavirus. Uh, he said polio vaccine. All right. Oh, okay. All right. Now, I'm, now I'm pissed. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the headline. It was. Uh, um, was see exact... if there's a polio. Hold on. What was the headline? Article. It was uh, UN. UN vaccine causes polio. UN vaccine causes polio. Okay. <clears throat> UN vaccine causes polio. Google you is know, not this sober show October. Shit. Google is compromised. Can <laughs> you just ask Jesus, please? UN says new polio outbreak in Sudan was caused by oral vaccine. Yeah. Whoa. It's not good. New polio outbreak in Sudan is caused by oral vaccine. And this, look at that kid's face. Oh my God, is that a terrifying image? The oh. image of them distributing that. Look at that poor kid's face. Imagine that kid getting polio from that vaccine. They're just, he looks so terrified. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, that's tragic. It's not oh. Then a bunch of them died, but you know, Jesus it's, Christ. Yeah, it's just Alex Jones. The hold on, hold on. Back up, back up, back up, back up. So the reason I show that is because if you don't know, this is the Joe Rogan podcast, one of the top rated podcasts, huge, huge audience. But what they're doing there is um, taking advantage of data voids. I'm gonna talk more about this, data deficits, data voids. The way that talk show hosts will often say, when you get home, Google this, giving people keywords to send them off into spaces where they're gonna find conspiratorial content. But the other reason this is important is that AP article was actually a very responsible article, but the headline was a disaster and the image was a disaster. And it therefore got pushed through conspiracy communities across Africa, across black communities in the US, and so I, I bring all of this together to say, we are not living in an information ecosystem of the late 1990s. The audience is networked and connected and bad actors are using missteps and taking advantage of it. So we don't have the ability to make mistakes now because there are people waiting to jump on us for doing, this, doing so. Um, so just very quickly, this idea of communication is critical. Um, this is a great, uh, I'm, I'm going to put the link in the chat, but this was a great conversation between some experts. And this is David Ropiak, and he's talking about risk communication specifically and saying it's not PR, it's risk communication. How do we talk to people about their own decisions about risk? Um, and he was talking about we didn't have a risk communication strategy ahead of COVID. And that's why we've made as many mistakes as we have done. And then Zainet, who I just mentioned, was also on this. And this, I think, is critical, which is rather than saying to people, these are the rules today, explain to people why the rules exist. So she's talking about explain to people airborne transmission, and therefore they will understand why they should be outdoors and why they should be wearing two masks. You know, rather than, you know, I've got friends in the UK who recently went to the cinema and I was like, what are you doing? And they said, well, the government is locking us down in two days time. So I need to get in before the government lockdown and no understanding around airborne transmission, just believed that she couldn't go to the cinema anymore. And so I think teaching people that there is a reason for this is again, something that we fail to do. Um, and instead we've just talked about rules and when they change, people don't, they, they don't follow, they don't make any sense and they're, um, that's why we have the fatigue that we're seeing now. And this idea of misinformation isn't the only problem. This is a report that we published in November where we analyzed social media posts in three languages from Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter over the summer. 
And what we wanted to understand is how people talk about vaccines. So we weren't just interested in misinformation, we were interested in narratives, because if we play whack-a-mole on particular claims that are false, that's when we make mistakes. And we showed six different narratives. And actually in the English language, so of course the US, uh, Australia and the UK also large anti-vax communities, but freedom and liberty is actually the biggest narrative. So it's not about whether or not the vaccine is safe, it's about this idea that people are going to control your body. There were people talking about safety and efficacy, um, and we've seen with the silver bullet narrative, we were saying, if everybody got vaccinated, we'll be safe. Now that's turned on its head with people saying, well, now you're telling me that once I get vaccinated, I still have to wear my mask? Well, what's the point of me getting vaccinated? So we kind of shot ourselves in the foot there by not thinking through the silver bullet narrative because ultimately we're now in the place that we're at. In Spanish language communities, lots of discussion about morality and religion. So understanding these narratives is helpful in terms of us thinking about counter narrative strategies and understanding what people's concerns are. So as I said, yes, there's some of this, but there's not actually that much of these ridiculous conspiracy theories. And in terms of the anti-vax community, we know them, they will never cease to exist. But if we disproportionately focus on them, we're missing the kind of movable middle. And many people in that movable middle have actually just got questions. So when we were looking at these narratives, a lot of the conversations were just, I'm confused and I can't find accurate information about something. And so we talked about this concept, which is a data deficit, which is they often emerge around something that's new. And so we have new vaccines and there is an absence of quality information. So something is new, you have a number of legitimate questions that emerge, but there's this deficit. And unfortunately that's where malicious actors fill those deficits by pushing their own ideas, by giving people keywords. As I said, we saw Joe Rogan talk about that and Alex Jones, Google this because they know what you're gonna find on the other side. And so that's when we have this problem of those kind of messages being laundered through the information ecosystem. Um, and so, as I said, this is just on one day, I just picked out people asking these very polite questions. Well, what is mRNA? Well. Can tell me somebody tell me does vaccine does it cause infertility infertility or in the UK well if it's safe why has Pfizer got indemnity like these are the kind of questions people are asking and we can't run away from these questions because if we're not answering them the conspiracy theorists are answering them so that's what we need to be aware of um, but also we have this problem of unfortunately some pretty poor press coverage. <laughs> around uh, the vaccine rollout. I wish we'd spent all of last year training journalists. Uh, we didn't and we've missed the boat. Um, but the idea of people sending out push alerts because of adverse effects is something that we've also got a problem with. Um, and so again, this idea of the current information ecosystem being weaponized, um, we're seeing this again and again, which is this idea of adverse effects, which is it is impossible to fact check somebody's personal experience. And so we're seeing any conversation about this happened to me being pushed and amplified by these groups and actors who are trying to undermine the vaccine. Um, and interestingly, the word side effects is now being turned into adverse effects. So that's the key word that we need to be monitoring, not side effects. So those kind of things are really important when we're thinking about communication strategies, what language is being used. Um, this is a tweet that came from BBC Woman's Hour, which is a radio show in my home country, which is an excellent piece of journalism normally. But this is another problem we have. In a recent survey, more than a quarter of 18 to 34 year olds, women said they would say no to a COVID jab, citing concerns about fertility and pregnancy. Are you reluctant and why? Now, this storytelling tactic worked 30 years ago when we had gatekeepers and we didn't have social media, but it doesn't work now because underneath tw this tweet, there were lots and lots of people responding with all of the conspiracies about vaccines. So it's we see a lot of this, which is news outlets just simply, oh, I'm just asking a question. And again, bad actors also do these on the platforms because this doesn't get taken down. Asking questions does not get that content doesn't get taken down on Facebook and Twitter. So um, again, it's a strategy that's specific. And this question about liberty and freedom that I said, there's a lot of people pushing this idea that it's about it's being mandatory. But then we have outlets like News for San Antonio saying, do you think that people should have to show proof that they've been vaccinated before they can go to a mall? Creating a space for people to fill that void with all sorts of responses. So the challenge here is how do we balance people's concerns, but also not open up spaces that can be weaponized. So 
just very quickly, we need to actively assess the kind of information people are seeing when they start Googling. So remember the video at the top, what is it that people find when they search? And here's an example. If I was on Facebook, I see somebody connecting the vaccine with Bell's palsy. And I'm like, oh goodness, I hadn't even known about that. So then I go to Twitter and I query Bell's palsy vaccine deaths. And I get these two back to back. The first one tells me that I'm gonna develop Bell's palsy. The next one says it doesn't increase my risk. So I'm left confused. So here we are, here's the definition of a data deficit. I'm seeking answers and I'm getting conflicted information. So if I go to Google and I query Bell's palsy vaccine deaths, this is, this is what I get. Now, this is really interesting on a number of different keywords. There's nothing here from the WHO. This number, number one is Forbes. Not brilliant. Secondly, verywellhealth.com. Stat, obviously excellent. The fourth one, very, very medical. So here's something that people are hearing on social media. They go to Google and there isn't an obvious, easy response to their question. And if I go to YouTube, remember YouTube is a, the second biggest search engine. You've actually got a lot of local news outlets here taking advantage of these keywords because they're looking for search engine optimization. But again, not health professionals but filling these data voids and not necessarily filling them in a way that we would say is most appropriate. So um, finally, when we think about how to respond to misinformation in face-to-face -face conversations, this person in the picture, actually the woman is a friend of mine from grad school and her husband, Mike, also pictured, died when he was 33 of a brain tumor. And she wrote this incredible piece for Vox talking about when that happened to my husband, I became a conspiracy theorist because I wanted to believe that I had agency, that there was somebody to blame. And so when we're talking about those people who believe conspiracy theories or misinformation, the number one thing to do, and I think you all know this because you're communication experts, is to listen. Where is the fear coming from? And understanding that they're trying to seek an explanation. And the more that we respond with, well, you know, it, you know, you're crazy to believe that, or it's really simple. Actually, it's about saying, this is what we know so far from the data, and we will continue to, to know more, but these are the risk factors right now. And one of the things I find very effective is to say to somebody, well, what medications are you on? And hearing what they talk about and then talking to them about side effects. Because one thing as a British person, listening to your pharmaceutical ads on television, how does anybody take any medications in this country when they list all of the side effects? So bringing this back to thinking about other, other comparisons that they can have, but it's all about empathy, it's all about listening, and it's understanding where the fear is coming from and being honest with your feedback. And I think the idea that we don't wanna talk about what's leading people into these conspiratorial thinking, not talking about things like indemnity is allowing the conspiracy theorists to fill that void. Um, and finally, when and how to respond to misinformation. We talk at First Draft about the tipping point, which is if you go looking for misinformation, you will always find it. But if you want to then publish a fact sheet on it or publish an explainer, you could be giving oxygen to something that's actually very niche and isn't particularly helpful. But if you let a conspiracy theory or a rumor travel too quickly and too far, it's very difficult to get back. So for those people who work in communications, thinking about that tipping point is really important. So you can measure that by how much engagement is a post getting? Is it traveling across platforms? Has a celebrity or a mainstream media outlet started talking about it? Those kind of questions before you just leap in, because unfortunately as humans, we're really bad at telling fact from fiction. And so repetition and familiarity means the more times you hear something you're like, well, somebody said something about vaccines and autism. I can't really remember what they said. And you've made a connection between two things that they previously hadn't heard of. And never do this. So we see a lot of this on government websites, which is the rumors are the things that are in bold and larger. And the truth is in a smaller font. No, do not ever do five myths about the COVID vaccine and list the myths thinking, well, I've used the word myth so people understand. We have lizard brains, remember? And so actually we're terrible when that connection is made. It reinforces that connection in our minds. And so you might have heard about the truth sandwich, which is where possible lead with the truth. Maybe mention the rumor, but give people a warning. And then you end with the truth again, because that familiar, familiarity and repetition, we want that to be around the truth. And um, there is just some great examples of people doing fun, engaging content out there and filling the data deficits. This is this amazing PhD student at Cornell doing a really nerdy talk with a whiteboard about mRNA, 4.1 million views, just really great. This is TikTok, obviously. Or Moderna vaccine. 
Um, you may have seen this one, which is like the nurse is dancing. Um, but actually, I got more from this video than I'd got from any official communication about the differences between the two shots. And I was like, why am I learning this on TikTok? So there's lots here when we think about ways to fill those data deficits of how do we make engaging content? Because the last thing I'll say is the other side understand that humans have an emotional and visual connection to information. We like to think that everybody has a rational relationship to information. And we think that people love 87 page PDFs. And so we are, there is an asymmetrical playing field here that on one hand you have outrage memes that are very compelling and very, very shareable. And we are creating content that is not engaging and not shareable and we're not winning. And that doesn't mean we should be dumbing down, but we have to find new ways to tell stories because it's 2021. And that if the more we can do that, the more we're gonna fill those data deficits. So um, if any of this sounds interesting to you, um, just to let you know, we have a Vaccine Insights Hub at First Draft, I'll share the link as well, where we, we update this daily. And we're about to roll out um, nine different uh, half hour training courses. So again, if there's anything around the concepts that I talked about, I'll share the link, but we're doing a lot right now to help people think about the particular challenges around communication and misinformation. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions, obviously. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I would say it's fantastic, but it's also terrifying, but it's both fantastic and terrifying. Uh, but but thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I want to just surface one question uh, that we got, which I think is related to the question of how and when to respond, perhaps less from the one-on-one -on -one communications and more from kind of the top-down governmental uh, communication. So the question is, just three days ago, Politico published an article stating that proactive advertising campaigns to encourage vaccine adoption and combat the spread of misinformation have been delayed due to slow vaccine rollout and short supply. An official was quoted as saying, we have to have the product available before we go out and encourage people to seek it. And we're not there yet. What implications does this have for proactive vaccine communications at the state and local level? Should state and local organizations be reserve reserving resources to deploy large scale campaigns more effectively in say two or three months. So that pose, two or three months. So pose, um, based on the idea that resources can be finite, do you try to get ahead of the misinformation or save it when people are closest to taking the action that you want them to take? So, I mean, resources are limited and we know this, which is nobody spends any money on communication and doesn't want to. And so the answer really is that I don't think that we should be not saying anything now. I mean, as I just described, there's a ton of things that we could be doing to lay a stronger foundation upon, you know, just how vaccines work. I mean, even that, if I walk down the street and ask many people, they don't actually know. If we talk about Moderna and Pfizer, it's like, which one's 90%, which one's 95%? We got caught up in the horse race of the vaccine as opposed to, why they matter, what it means for a community, why, you know, the history of vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we know that there are problems with equity and distribution. We know all of that. I think there's there's campaigns, which is, this is why, this is how you get it. Like, this is how the website works so you can get on it. There's that kind of like call to action. But I would argue that there's like underlying communication needs right now to ensure that A, those data deficits don't get full of conspiracy theories. You've got a three month head start on us who are trying to undermine. I mean, the silver bullet narrative is a real problem. We're seeing a huge uptick in that right now with people saying it's pointless to get vaccinated. So if we know that's happening, how can we get ahead of that or at least be in parallel with that as opposed to in three months time being like, oh yeah, we should have done something earlier yeah. because we've lost ground. So, I mean, we should have been communicating much more strategically for the last year, but there wasn't the money, but I would say if we if we sit on our hands now, we're going to have more problems in three months' time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One other one other question that we often get is that you know if you try on the there's an instinct to try to keep track um, of misinformation to track it to stay on top of it to make sure you're getting ahead of it, which can be overwhelming because there's so much of it and can also distract you from actually focusing on the truthful proactive message. So how would you encourage people track misinformation if they should? Um, and how do you balance always responding to the misinformation with focusing on, on what you actually want to say independent of the misinformation? Yeah, I mean, that's partly why I try to make this message um, stick, which is there's a lot of resourcing and money and misinformation is sexy right now. I say that as somebody who's been doing it for 10 years and it was not sexy. But fundamentally, we should be spending more time on creating quality and accurate information and building trust 
with people who can who are going to get vaccinated rather than playing whack-a-mole with the real hardcore Bill Gates stuff. I mean, organizations should have somebody monitoring this stuff just to make sure that there isn't something that could who that could spiral out of control. I mean, the one thing I always think about chronic and acute misinformation, there was a case study in Pakistan in spring of 2019, when a video of what looked like children fainting after getting vaccinated went viral. Over three days, health clinics were burnt to the ground, three people lost their lives. It just went like this. So we should always be on the lookout for that acute moment that could cause real harm. But a lot of this stuff is chronic. So having one person or collaboration, something like this, you know, we should be able to feed out to people, these are the overwhelming narratives this week, so that there's not 26 people in 26 different offices all monitoring the same social media. That's that's the kind of scale thing we should be doing. Um, but we should be doing a lot more in terms of thinking about how do we push out the accurate information and fill those data deficits. Yeah. And I think that there's been a disproportionate focus on playing whack-a-mole with the rumors to the detriment of us actually creating quality, accurate information. Absolutely. Um, a few problematic narratives that folks um, offered in the chat. We don't have to do a deep dive into these, but just wanted to raise them in case they spark conversation. One is the very common narrative about speed, that the vaccine was rushed or we should just wait um, to make sure it's safe. And of course, if you can get people to put off an action, um, you don't actually have to convince them not to ever do it, but it's a win if you can just get them to stop for a little while. Um, another narrative that we heard is, the idea of natural immunity or the defaulting to doing to doing nothing feels safer than taking on something that's risky. Anything coming to mind immediately for how and whether to, to deal with those types of narratives? Yeah, so for example, on the, you know, Operation Warp Speed, as we know, was politicized and the name was a disaster. But things like mRNA have been around, you know, people have been working on this for almost a decade. And we've completely failed to tell those stories about how Zika, it was used on Zika, it was tested around previous coronaviruses. It was like we just pretended that mRNA turned up in 2020. And so again, we should have been doing a better job of saying the underlying technology is not new. Um, and I, you know, and again, I don't think we've done a good enough job of explaining phase three trials. Like we just, we got obsessed with the 90 versus 95% and we didn't explain how science works. And I think, so yes, again, acknowledging. So if you're having a conversation with somebody, you're not going to, oh, don't be an idiot. Of course it's safe. Like that doesn't help. But by saying, I get it. Like I'm, I'm reading everything myself. Like I, this is our own lives. You know, of course we have to do the research, but you know, everything that we know, suggests that all of the, the tests and blah, blah, blah. so I think that that's something that you know we just need to be better at doing and then with the the immunity piece again it depends on the person but I always find it's very effective to show how many anti-vax websites are selling health supplements to talk about well it's interesting isn't it that this guy who's pushing that vaccines are bad is making an absolute fortune over here selling vitamin b and so trying to connect that and i mean it's slightly different from saying it's better off doing nothing but again you know things like long covid i think we fail to really talk about the implications of that so you know it's this is really really complicated and there isn't an easy way on any of these arguments but it's why you have to listen understand somebody's fears and then try and find a response that matches their fears rather than having a blanket. If somebody says X, say Y, because it, it, everybody's slightly different. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions um, for Claire, either in the chat or um, feel free to unmute yourself um, and, and offer a question out loud as well. Eric, is it okay if I ask a question? Um, I'm new, new to this session. Uh, my name's Theo, um, founder and CEO of, of a public health charity in the UK. Claire, I found your presentation really interesting. Um, one question that actually came up while watching it, because I think the idea of fast science is, is one of the critical problems we've got. But in addition, I noticed with the twit, one of the Twitter slides you showed, it had an image which I've seen also associated to reputable news sites or to reliable information. And it seems that because so many of us are in a rush to get stock images to find uh, compelling imagery to attract attention, that we're actually using the same visual associations when it comes to misinformation and credible information. I didn't know if you had any thoughts on how we go about tackling that, that challenge. No, it's a great point, because actually when we did our research, and obviously it was about narratives, I, I brought that up to the research team, which is what, what are the dominant visuals that are getting used to push these different things? And hearing you say that makes me think that we should do some kind of primer 
um, that almost says these, these are the ways that these rumors are being pushed through the power of, of visuals. And in an age of Instagram and TikTok and everything else, we, we do have to understand how those are being used. And I think um, that's a great point. And I think we, we understudy visuals uh, and we don't realize how powerful they are. But I think that, as I said, we can't disconnect what's on social media with reputable news organizations. They are unfortunately a, you know, a huge part of this and are making missteps. We know that they're under-resourced, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, they're also not thinking about the ways that things are being weaponized. So, you know, Joe Rogan be like, look at that kid's face from that AP article. You know, that kind of thing that then gets weaponized in a way that I don't think people recognize. Okay, um, why don't we shift gears here? I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Stephanie Friedhoff. And I know there are a handful of other questions. Why don't we save those um, until the end? We'll have plenty of time for more Q&A. So Stephanie. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, Just a second. So I think my role is to, um, first of all, welcome again, everybody, and, and thank you for being here. And you're all our communications experts, so I don't know that um, uh, any of this will be super new to you, um, but I think my role is to um, embed the fantastic presentation that um, Claire has just given a little bit in um, behavioral sciences, communications, best practices, and uh, really sort of the, the larger world of public health. Um, I want to respond to that uh, question earlier about uh, natural immunity um, as one example where um, just again, like a lot of what I will say will, will really connect hopefully with what Claire has laid out. Uh, the way to natural immunity is a lot of dying. And the reason why people do not think about that is because the story of we can reach herd immunity by all just getting sick has been really well told by the misinformation agents. And the story of um, how natural herd immunity will lead or natural immunity, right, will, will uh, be fine has, uh, will, will be a lot of death has not been told so well. There have been waves where people have been asking why, it's hard to get into the hospitals, right? It's hard to visualize all these numbers, um, but, but that is just one of the core, um, and, and we'll go through some of these examples, but I wanted to just quickly provide a little bit of framing. Um, uh, as Claire has laid out, um, it's super messy right now. So I, uh, as Estella said, I work with Ashish Jha. You know, he has a large public profile right now. We sit every morning and look at what's going on and what, do, what are the stories that we need to tell today or what are the important things, you know, he's answering a lot of these immediate questions from viewers and elsewhere. Um, and it's, it's messy for a number of reasons, right? It's the new information needs that Claire has mentioned. It is the, um, we have outdated health communication practices and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the key point to know here is that some of the things that we thought worked, they don't work anymore. Claire has laid some out, I'll mention some more. We have this new media ecosystem, don't need to cover that. Um, we have the political polarization, but we also have all these infrastructure failures. So part of why this is so messy is like from a public health viewpoint, we just constantly screw up in this pandemic. And that is a communications challenge in itself that we want to be aware of. And, and we wanna talk about sort of how we can mitigate that. And as you are all in the role of communicator and not in the role of uh, uh, actually handling the logistics, right? That, that provides additional challenges. And then of course, uh, Inequity is the big word, um, uh, not just in the vaccine distribution, but in this in this whole pandemic, um, and the perceptions about the the equity and inequity. I think um, also deeply shape uh, communications and communications errors, as you know now about vaccines. Um, so, taking um, Claire's great overview, I wanted to talk for a moment about what influences people's decision to get vaccinated. So if we take this back to the individual that receives, you know, various forms, like is looking for information, receives various form of information and, and misinformation, right? What, what are the other things that, that influence um, my decision about getting vaccinated or not, right? So it's how I see the world. Those, that's my worldview, that's my values. Um, it's, are people I trust saying it's what we should do? 
It's are people like me taking it. It's the risk components that Claire has also mentioned, right? Is it is am I getting a whole lot of confusing messages and different things from everywhere, or you know, am, is is it starting to make sense to me? Is there consistency in what's being communicated? And the question we most often forget is the actual access, which is, will it be hard for me to get the vaccine, or is it actually easy? So. Um, I'll walk through some of these that are more important and skip over others also because Claire has, has covered some of them. But to me, the most important one is the understanding the worldviews, identities, and moral values. So, apologies, um, Stephanie, interrupt. If you're advancing your slides, we're still seeing the, the title slide. So there may be, if you shift maybe presenter mode. Did I, I'm in presenter mode. I'm so sorry. You're not seeing all of that. No, no worries. I can also, I have your slides as well. And so if, if we're frozen here for a moment, we can project on our end. Yeah, Zoom says my screen sharing is paused. Do you just want to put up the slides? Sure. Out? Yep. Thank you, sorry about that. Right, so if you want to go to the next one. So what views, identities and moral values, right? Um, just for framing, um, it's important, especially identities are important because um, they, they often do not overlap with demographics. We think about people in demographics when uh, the groups, the social groups that we identify with are much more important in this context. Um, and uh, I've listed a couple of questions that you can think about when you, when you engage with people either online or offline, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if you're planning a campaign or if it's about an individual phone call or a conversation, it's about like what is important to the audience or to this person. What do they see as right or wrong? What do they care about? What do they consider fair? It's those types of questions. Do you want to move forward, Eric? Um, we have all heard so much about the trusted messengers um, and how important that is. I just wanted to re-emphasize it. Uh, I still see a lot of, so in preparation for this, um, I've gone through the, uh, the latest sort of roundup of communications advice that is out there for how to communicate about the vaccine. And there's still so much of like, ask the community leaders for input. Don't ask the community leaders for input, let them lead, right? This is not a campaign that you design and then you ask the community leader to like give you feedback on. Um, that conversation needs to start a lot earlier. And it needs to, the, 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 the bigger frame here is, um, as Claire has also mentioned, there's no sort of um, one type fits all. And in, in the framework of why do our, our um, previously held beliefs about our, of our awesome communication campaigns don't work so well anymore, is because of course by now we are able to recognize how targeted messaging needs to be. Um, and how much we need to understand about, again, these individual um, uh, beliefs and identities that, that drive people's decision-making. So when you really try to do that, you're automatically at the community level and doesn't matter if it's an online community or a physical offline community, right? Uh, and um, the, the messages need to be translated, the language, part of why this is so complicated is like, we try to like as a white person i try to translate something into how a black person would talk about it which would never work right so it's only the people within the community that can take the evidence and can take it forward uh, and embed it in into whichever way people talk about it um so if you want to move on eric uh let's just skip over that you all know this <laughs> let's skip over that uh, clear covered the risk um so I wanted to quickly share for all of you, again, this is sort of a reminder, I think we all know this, but it's important sort of the crisis communications best practices. Um, part of uh, what, what we consistently, what leaders consistently get wrong is um, uh, waiting until all the evidence is there or until you feel like there's enough evidence and then uh, being uh, over reassuring that you know. So saying, in two months, we will be done with phase 1A and we'll have all these people vaccinated. That has backfired, right? It's testing like anything, mask wearing, the, the best example from the pandemic is mask wearing. 
it been so much better if we said, we think, you know, this is how we know masks work and don't work. Be neither, be, you know, be neither too strong on the masks don't work nor on the masks do work, right? Until you have the evidence. And that is how we take people along in this environment where, as we say, new evidence becomes available over time. And we need to be, be able to authentically move our position based on what we're learning. And, and the key to that is to not be over-assuring in the places where we don't actually know all the answers. So share uncertainty, right? That's a part of that. Um, as Claire has said, uh, validate emotions and, and express empathy. Um, giving people things to do is really important. So giving people um, we, we started out well with, you know, everybody making masks and this has completely petered out. People do not know how to contribute and they're tired of the, I know I have to wear my mask and get tested, right? So how can people actively participate? I get questions on Twitter about um, uh, how can I help, right? How can I help get the vaccines to the people who, who need them? So um, being more creative in, in letting community participate is, is also super important. Um, admitting and apologizing for errors that never gets old and we all know it. Um, and the, the key piece, um, the sharing the dilemmas, I think is part of what Zeynep does so well. Claire has, has mentioned her, uh, a couple others do too, but it is laying out that that often here there are no good pathways. And if I can speak off the record for a second, we see this so well right now. Everybody talks about equitable vaccine distribution. Everybody is concerned about it. Nobody has a solution. So we, I talked with Connecticut yesterday, we talked with California the day before, but the, there's just so much struggle because we want to get this right but it is just really very hard because of the lack of infrastructure, the lack of access, um, and sort of these compounding um, um, components, right, that, that make this so hard. So but what that means for communication is that we, we need to be careful in not over-promising and under-delivering on this equitable distribution um, promise. Eric? Um, and then, um, I was also, it seemed like the, the prior questions were um, about how do I talk to, how do I individually talk with family members and, and friends and, and what are some ways to make those conversations with, with, you know, we all have an uncle or a person, you know, who watches a lot of Fox News. Um, it, the listen is the biggest one. And again, Claire has already mentioned that, but what's equally as important is this is not a food fight, right? We've had too many food fights uh, over who has the right answer. Um, it's not about contradicting false beliefs. Um, building a relationship and building trust is about finding sort of common ground, right? Finding a way to engage. And now this is super hard. Lots has been written about it. Um, and then assessing and tailoring the responses based on the sense and the feeling that we get about where people are coming from. Right? Do they have a conservative view about, um, you know, would it be helpful to say something like, uh, 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 you think America can't do this? Yes, America can do this. We can do 3 million vaccines in like two days. Um, or is it more a progressive value that goes towards fairness and, and um, uh, helping others out? Um, tell stories, not statistics. Uh, this again, um, has been really hard in this pandemic. And, and um, I was gonna tell the story of the Senate hearing that we had about hydroxychloroquine, which to me was a big eye opener um, back to the misinformation um, where the, um, the doctors that are, so I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you all know, but let me explain, right? Hydroxychloroquine is a malaria treatment that has been found uh, not uh, helpful to treat um, COVID-19. And the people that are still helping, uh, that, are, that are still pushing this treatment uh, have found a way to um, wrap it into these very valid concerns in the African American community about uh, about the medical establishment uh, uh, and mistreatment by saying that uh, 
African Americans are disproportionately dying from COVID, and uh, they're not getting this really important and valuable treatment. And after that narrative was pushed out, I started to see increasingly people who, um, where I would say we share the same values, um, uh, sort of um, fall for the hydroxychloroquine trap. So uh, that, that type of story um, uh, helped me understand that topic. So we talked a bit about why language matters. Um, once you think about the values and um, the identities of people, I think it becomes easier to identify what language matters and why not to use these words such as conspiracy theories, anti-vaxxers and so forth. Um, and then being authentic, transparent. And then the most important part is because we're in this new environment, reflecting and iterating, seeing what works and what doesn't and a, a sort of changing our approach. And I'll stop right there. I think we should skip over that. We sure. only have 10 minutes and I'd love to hear questions. Sure. Um, so I'm gonna catch up on, on questions in the chat, but one that um, that we got was the idea of, you know, community leaders leading. I, there's always a concern there about letting control of the message from a public health perspective. But if you actually let someone who's not a public health practitioner or have a public health degree lead, they're not gonna say exactly what we might want to say in the public health world. So what, what guidance, other than that's okay, what, I guess what guidance would you give to people about the, the balance of letting control of the message a little bit to make sure that's authentic to the audience that's hearing it? Yeah, I think that that is a key question. Um, in the conversations that we've been having um, around equitable vaccine distribution and a vaccine confidence in communities of color, um, there it has, for example, been brought up many, many times by community leaders um, that the narrative of uh, communities of colors going first may not be the right one. And that in order to build long-term trust, uh, you may you know, just accept that this is a choice and that by seeing white people get vaccinated first, that might actually be a much better way to build long-term trust and, and get large parts of the um, communities of color vaccinated. That is something that is hard to swallow for uh, anybody who wants to save lives immediately and who has the public health lens of, this is where the problem is, here's how I want to fix it. Uh, we re need to really listen to that. Um, and the part of why this is complicated is that it requires long-term relationship building. Vaccine confidence in, in disenfranchised communities is highest where um, states and cities have pre-existing relationships with their community-based organizations. So anything that one can do to build these long-term relationship and move to a shared model of governance around these issues is where we're also making post-pandemic impact in those communities. Um, so I'm sorry that is not a quick and dirty answer, but these are systemic problems that won't be, be served with a quick communications campaign to get people to. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions, either in the chat or feel free to unmute. Do you have one more poll question, um, which we can go to that may start a helpful discussion. Um, as I mentioned at the top, we wanna to understand how we can take this fantastic conversation and make sure that as you know, the secretary of this community of practice, we're turning it into actionable tools um, for you all to the degree that, that we can help do that. Um, so let's put the link one more time to the third and fourth survey question in the chat. Um, and so we're curious, uh, you know, of, on this question, what types of resources would be most useful for you? Um, of the, f there should be four here that came to mind for us. There you go. So 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It did two leading answers here, um, and I understand why, or suggested answers are infographics and ready, ready-made content, um, the ones that have sort of the answers on, on the page for us, um, which can be the most immediately available, um, immediately accessible to use, often the most difficult to tailor to different audiences and, and different contexts. Um, so I'm curious for folks who said one or two of those, could you just maybe unmute yourself and, and speak to maybe the contexts, the mediums, the channels in which you would find those answers or those infographics or other types of content most, most, um, most useful for you? Uh, this is Rachel. I think for, um, whoops, I lost the, the answer sheet, but the specific answers to questions I think can be useful when responding to reporters. Like sometimes if you want to reach out to a reporter to counteract a particular piece of information that they've written mm -hmm. uh, and you don't feel like you're an expert on a topic, you feel like you're not bad, but you're not great. And if somebody else could, um, like give you more precise words than you could come up with yourself, then you would feel more emboldened to respond to a reporter. Right. And there are all kinds of pitfalls you can fall into in those types of conversations, like accidentally repeating the thing you're trying to counteract during your quote, which only gives it more, uh, more headline space and quote space. Um, Right, and the answers that seem so easy for us when we're explaining them to ourselves, once we get on the phone, on the record, suddenly we're a bit more tongue-tied, certainly know how that works. So having the script in front of you in that context can be useful. Other thoughts or questions on, on contexts in which you would use these resources? Hi, uh, my name is Julia and I work for a global health nonprofit and we are currently trying to set up a, um, a mobile platform where people can ask questions about COVID generally. And it was launched in November, specifically just about COVID and the spread of COVID and prevention. Um, and kind of to Claire's point, we're now in this situation where people are starting to ask questions about the vaccine, but we don't have prepared content or messaging on exactly what the responses should be to these questions. Um, and it would be really great to kind of have specific tailored messages that could be, you know, taken into the that context and translated into French um, so that phone operators like have a go to message to to reply and not just kind of their own personal thoughts. On right. It. Um, are the an the questions to which you don't have the answers ready? Is it that the answers don't necessarily exist in a form that would be satisfying to the audience or they haven't been translated from the technical answer into the, the public facing answer? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a little bit of both. I think that um, kind of this idea of how best, there's all of these tips out there, right, on how best to deliver that message. So, right, the truth sandwich, things like that. Um, but like we, like I personally, um, work more on the data side and actually not the communication side. And so we would love to have like a set of messages that are already scripted and then they could be tailored for the context of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But um, they're not hard questions to answer, but wanting to not like further fuel the misinformation and making sure that best practices are used. I think it would be great if there was like one resource that people could refer to and go to um, that had these like short and con concise messages that could be delivered. Absolutely. Because we are at time and I'm, I'm cognizant of, of most, many people have hard stops and more Zoom calls these days. We're happy to stick around for a few minutes, but just to wrap up with a few immediate next steps. Um, there are some resources that have just um, been put into the chat box. Uh, we'd encourage you to check out. We will also include all of those um, in a wrap up email to you all. So uh, if you're lost in the scroll of the chat box, um, that's not your last chance. Um, we'll also be sending perhaps a more detailed survey on some of these resources once we've had a chance to put our heads together um, to see if, if our vision for what might we be able to produce um, would, would meet some of these needs. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and also our next webinar, two 
Thursdays from now, we'll be with Ad, Count, Ad Council um, to walk through a really comprehensive um, series of audience research they've conducted about vaccine hesitancy, motivations, barriers, and message recommendations with some of the, the target audiences that we've been talking through today. So we will be sending a save the date and invite for that, um, but just a heads up that that is on the horizon. All right, with that, I'm happy, we're happy to stick around for more questions, uh, but feel free to hop if you need to. And thank you again, of course, to Stephanie and, and Claire for taking the time um, late in the day when it should be time for, for tea or something stronger. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Thanks for the invitation. I have to jump, but if anybody needs me. Um... Sure. We're happy to pass questions along uh, to Stephanie and Claire afterwards as well. Great. Right. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. It's Rachel. I'm just making sure I get a couple links from the chat. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm not sure I have any insightful questions. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Um, and we'll send all these assets around um, after the call. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. As, as no one else is um, speaking, I'm just thinking, um, this is the first time I've seen like uh, this sort of coordination amongst different organizations actually speaking openly about their challenges and coming out with potential solutions. I did just share a Trello board. I think the WHO started it and it's not um, being put back into action. But a lot of the questions which are being discussed today is like, how do we coordinate messaging and things like that? Having a simple tool like that that's available to um, X number of people who have the passcodes, et cetera, can't be misused, um, might be one of those ways. Or even just if it's all credible content, then I guess it can't be undermined in that way. But um, putting pressure on those sort of things being readily available may be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Are you thinking more of, um, well, Static, it sounds a bit too basic, but um, a static resource that any individual user could go to to ask, you know, get their answers and their messages versus a resource to share information and talk to each other in, in real time. Which of those, or maybe both, were, would be more, more valuable to you? I think for a social media team, having something like, I mean, we don't use Trello, but people know how to use it. And knowing that something like that is being updated. These are the hashtags we're using. We can coordinate these. This is what we're campaigning for this week. If we want to focus on vaccine equity or lobbying for IP to be opened, then you can kind of coordinate action that way, um, as well as maybe produce the visual content. So it's got the similar representation across the board. Yeah. Um, I guess that's, so I think something like this static, but moving um, or at least coordinated by some people would be welcome. Sure. I, I would point you initially to, um, so Stephanie Friedhoff's uh, COVID testing toolkit um, is half of that. It has ideas for hashtags, pre-made content, guidance for thinking through a campaign. It doesn't perhaps have the, the coordinated aspect, which is something that we can think about, but that might be um, a good start. Perfect. Thank you. All right.